Okay, so um, thanks, Scotty, for that introduction. So <clears throat> I grew up on a farm in Kansas, and I was a school teacher for three years. And so given the teaching theme, there's supposed to be some handouts going around now. So um, they're going to hand out some, you know, you can't get away before lunch without taking some notes, okay? So these, is, these are fill-in-the-blank type handouts. So at least you'll, you've been hearing that you're supposed to take something away from this. Well, at least you can take this away. Um, may go in the trash, but at least you can um, fill in some of the notes. But um, as that's going around, let me give you a little bit more of my background. Like I said, I grew up on a farm in Kansas. I taught math and coached basketball and football for three years at a large high school outside of Kansas City. And then I heard about this startup financial services company from a guy named Ron Blue. I'd just been married a year. I thought, well, I'm good with numbers. I'm a math teacher. I'm decent with people, so I put everything in a U-Haul, and my young wife of one year and I, I'd never been east of the Mississippi, we came to Atlanta to go to work for this startup financial services company, as, as Scotty mentioned, and I've had the privilege for almost 40 years now, almost four decades, of doing this idea of tying faith and family and money and legacy all together. So what I'm hopefully going to do in this short time we have together is take what, what Scotty said early on about living with a why. My why has been to help people apply 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. I've basically been in the instruction business for almost 40 years. It says to instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, that are fixed to hope in the uncertainty of riches, but in God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, storing up for themselves a solid foundation for the future. So we're in the instruction business, and I want to give you some instruction about how do you tie all this together? How do you make sure you live a life well spent so you don't get to the end of your life and have any regrets? You know, you heard Billy talk about legacy, and legacy is an incredibly powerful word. And you're building your legacy right now as you invest in people as you go through your life. First and foremost, your family, and secondarily, other people that you impact. Three weeks ago tomorrow, I got in the car with my wife and drove five hours to Sumter, South Carolina to go to the funeral of a 34-year client. And so as we went to this funeral, went into the, went into the um, sanctuary, there were probably at least 500 people there with standing room only all around the outside as they told the stories of this man's generosity. So see, that's why, men and women, this verse really applies. It says, instruct those who are rich to be generous and rich in good works. We all have a choice of two four-letter words. We either do that which makes us wise, or we don't do that, and we try to be like the farmer over in Luke 12, who, when he had success, he just built bigger barns, and he was called a what? He was called a fool. So we all have a choice. Either we live wise lives, or we lead foolish lives. And I would encourage you that, I want to be like that guy whose funeral I went to three weeks ago. I want my legacy to be one that I poured my life out investing in people. And you get to do this in what you do vocationally, and what you do in your families, and so on and so forth. So what I want to do is give us some perspective about how does all this stuff tie together. And when I think about perspective, I think about the story of the young lady who went off to college. She wrote to mom and dad, said, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry I haven't written to you sooner, but I was involved in the revolution here on campus. And when we burnt down the administrative building, I was burned. But don't worry, Mom and Dad, I'm recovering quite nicely. And while I was here in the hospital, I met a really nice orderly. He's a really nice guy. He's a Harry Krishna, but don't worry about that. He's a really nice guy, and you can get your desire to become grandparents real soon. And you can come visit the baby in Nepal. Love, Susan. P.S. There was no fire. I'm not pregnant. I don't even have a boyfriend, but I did flunk chemistry and English, and I wanted you to keep that in proper perspective. <laughs> so what, what I want to do is give us some proper perspective about life. And so you see a diagram at the top of your sheet there. Let me just ask a question. Does anybody here have a problem with balance in your life? That's the left side of the diagram. Does anybody have a problem with balance? A couple of people are telling the truth, everybody else is lying. I mean, does, I mean, none of you have a problem with balance? I mean, I'm seeing some heads, but yeah. Balance is an elusive thing, right? So if I were to ask you, what areas on the left side of that diagram tend to be the toughest to keep in balance? What would you say? World? What, what two? What two send team to, what, I heard it over here. Family and work. 
So we'd probably all agree that family and work are the two that are toughest to keep in balance. You ever stop thinking about why? When you finally get the big house and have the bank account, you didn't need it. When you started out your career, you didn't have it. It all seems backwards, right? You're starting your career, you're starting in the business, you're raising these kids, and it all seems backwards. But God in his infinite wisdom knew it was going to be like that. So the key for you and I is how do we live through this process to deal with our money, which sits right in the middle of that diagram, to try to have some balance so we don't get to the end of our life and have any regrets. The gentleman in Sumter, South Carolina had no regrets. I don't want you to have any regrets. And see, the problem is if we don't get our perspective right on this, we'll spend our life out of balance amassing financial capital at the expense of spiritual and social capital that would come to those after us. I've sat with too many people worth tens of millions of dollars and watched tears streaming down their face as they told me the story of destroyed families, of not knowing their kids. They couldn't even do estate planning because they didn't know their children or they were estranged from them. You see, they had not spent time building social and spiritual capital at the same time they're building financial capital. If you turn, now some of you are thinking, now how do I write all these definitions in that one line? Turn the sheet over, okay? So I've given, I've given you, and I know some of you are not gonna get everything filled out and you'll come up and see me afterwards because some of you are anal, right? You'll wanna fill in every blank, so just come find me. And we'll get them filled out. But on the back of that sheet, you'll see the definitions. And we all understand financial capital. That's the things that we buy with our money, stocks, bonds, real estate, invest in our business, whatever. That's financial capital. Spiritual capital is understanding God's word and being able to apply it. You heard Billy talk about truth. See, we all have a choice. Truth is that it was defined as fact or reality. We either get the truth from the world or we get the truth from God's word. And I would just appeal to you that you need to get the truth about money. That's why I wrote one of those books, it's called The Truth About Money Lies. We buy all these lies about money. But we need to get the truth. And we're all free to accept or reject the truth, but we're never free from the consequences if we decide to reject it. So what I'm sharing with you comes from not a personal experience, but it comes from what the Bible says, and it comes from working with people that the world would say are successful, but understanding what really made them successful. So spiritual capital is understanding what the Bible says and being able to apply it. How do you apply biblical principles of leadership? How do you apply biblical principles of, of how to be a mom and dad? How do you apply biblical principles of how to work heartily uh, in your business? That's spiritual capital. Now what's social capital? Social capital are the characteristics that help you be effective in society. It's things like integrity and punctuality and perseverance and work ethic. Now see, here's where it's real interesting. People get out of balance trying to amass all this to give their kids the stuff they didn't have. What their kids really need is more of them and less of their stuff. And what's the worst thing that happens if you don't give your kids a bunch of stuff? They have to learn how to work like you and build character. Think, think about that. Think about that. I've seen too many, too many people that made it their life's goal to amass all this stuff so their kids wouldn't have to have it like they had it when what their kids really need is to have less of their stuff and more of them. Socrates says, what mean you fellow citizens? You turn every stone to scrape wealth together and take so little care of your children to whom one day will relinquish it all. And remember this, children are the living messages you send to a time you're not gonna see. They really are your legacy. You're sending them on ahead and you're not gonna be there. You know, unfortunately though, we get out of balance, right? Swinson in his landmark book, Margin said, we need room to breathe, we need freedom to think. Our relationships are being starved to death by velocity, and our children lay wounded on the ground over by high-speed good intentions. Did you catch that? We need room to breathe. We need freedom to think. We, need, we don't have time to listen, let alone love. And you heard Billy talk about love as the last of the seventh point. So here's the big idea on that diagram, is how do we begin to get balance in our life? so that we can focus on building spiritual and social capital and building a legacy that really lasts. The reason that's supposed to look like a house on the right is, if you don't build a solid foundation, it doesn't matter what you have financially, okay? So I would propose to us, the other key words to write down there is, we're focusing on posterity, not prosperity. I was gonna entitle the book, um, Your Life Well Spent, Posterity versus prosperity, but everything's posterity is your rear end. That's not your rear end, okay? It's posterity, that's the generations that come after you. 
So we all have a choice. We either focus on living a life that's going to focus on people or we're going to focus on prosperity as ill-defined by the world. I like to say a life well spent is a life that earns and uses money to buy time, to impact people, to be productive and effective in society so you get to the end of your life and have no regrets. So let me just give you a few things to change your thinking. And Billy talked about this. It, we have to think right. I have three boys, and the oldest one, when he was young, and you made him lose his train of thought. He said, hey, Dad, you got my thinking off. Well, our thinking is off in this area of money. So I'm going I'm to give you three ways to think right about your money. I'm going to give you one way to think right about your children and one way to think right about retirement. And hopefully, as you think right, you heard Billy talk about your mind, as you think right, it'll help you begin to get some balance so you can enjoy the trip. So you can live a life of no regrets. So you can live a life well spent. So what's the, one of the first lies we buy? See, Satan's only got one game. Satan's only got one game, and that is he's a liar. The problem is he's really good at it. He's really, really good at it. So what he wants to do is lie to us about this area of money. So the first thing he tells us is that money is a measure of your self-worth. Money is not a measure of your self-worth. You go work hard. You work hard for one life. You, you work in your communities. And that's your job. But we read in Scripture, it says, in Deuteronomy 8, you think it's your ability, make, your ability to make wealth. No, I, the Lord, have given you the ability to make wealth. You're worth an incredible amount regardless of what your financial net worth says. Ephesians 2.10 says, you're Christ's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So the lie we buy is that, you know, we get out of balance thinking, if I just make more money, then I'm going to be worth something. The truth is, you're worth an incredible amount. You may or may not have money. Okay? That's a function of how hard you work, how efficient you are, and God's blessing in your life. It's not just being out of balance to amass the wealth. So money is not a measure of self-worth. And um, let me give you an illustration of, of why you need to think right about this. And that's called the principle of limited sphere. So some of you are filling in the blanks. So how many of you have been to Kansas on vacation? Hey. Thank you. Okay, a few people. It's a beautiful state, you know, but everybody's mad at it because they're trying to get to Colorado. And Colorado gets a break because they got the mountains. But eastern Colorado is way, way uglier than western Kansas. But, so here, here, here's what I want you to catch. So when the kids were young, we had three boys, and Julie and I, we'd go back to see grandparents in Kansas. We'd put the kids in the car and we'd take off to go back and see grandparents. And sometimes we'd go on to Colorado for a vacation. But we had this tradition where we would get off the interstates and go on the two-lane roads to see the countryside. Now you can do that west of the Mississippi. East of the Mississippi, they just, the roads just go everywhere. But when you get west of the Mississippi, you can get on these two lane roads and they'll parallel the interstates. And we did that so we could see the countryside, get to see kind of some of the local flavors and all this. And so the boys are like, we want to go to you know, Burger King, we want to go to Pizza Hut. We say, when you have your kids, you can go on the interstates and go to those places. We're going to go to the local cafes. You know, and you, know, you go through these little towns, the menu's on a grease board, and when you walk in, they say, you aren't from around here, are you? Those kind of things. But here's what would happen. We'd be driving on these two-lane roads, and you come up to the outskirts of a town, and up on the hills, this great big house, you know, white fence, around the 80 acres, the guy's got Hereford cattle out there. This is a guy that has the financial capital. He's probably the banker, the lawyer, the businessman, you name it, but he's got the big spread, you know, he's got, got it. And then you go on into town, the houses get a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller, and pretty soon you go across the railroad tracks and a bunch of double wide trailer houses and you're out of town. You got the visual? Any of you ever done that? What happens 40 miles down the road? Exact same thing. Come up to the next town, 30 miles down the road. You know, you got, you got the nice side of town, the people that have financial capital, smaller houses, double wides, out of town. And then, I, and then I thought about it. The guy in this town doesn't know what the guy in this town has. So if you're making your ambition to build financial capital, you will always only impress a limited sphere of people. You will always only impress a limited sphere of people. But if you use your money to invest in your family and what God's doing around the world, you can impact an unlimited sphere of people. Men and women, do you catch that? That's the difference. We all have a choice. We either make it our goal to build this big financial pile. And believe me, I work with a lot of wealthy people. And what Billy said is right. There's no happiness, no matter how big the pile gets. 
okay? So what you want to do is you want to earn your money and invest it in such a way to enjoy the trip and have balance because if you impact your family, if you impact others, if you invest in what God's doing around the world, you're going to impact an unlimited sphere of people. Because no matter what you do on this earth, there's only going to be a limited number of people that ever know what you have. Maybe it's 200 people, maybe it's 500, but it's still limited. But if you invest your money in what God's doing, and you invest in your family, these living messages you're going to send to a time you won't see, you can impact an unlimited sphere of people. So, principle of limited sphere. The next, next blank there, life does not consist of your possessions. You know, what do you, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you weren't given? So don't get out of balance thinking my self-worth is tied to my financial net worth because that is a lie. You work hard, you provide for your family, you make as much money as you can, you store it up, but you invest it along the way. So that's the first lie we believe. The second lie we believe is that somehow if I had more money, I'd be content. How many of you are making more today than you were 15 years ago? Any, anybody? How many of you thought 15 years ago, if you're making what you're making today, you'd be content? So my question is, are you content? No, see, it's an interesting thing. You know, we just think that if I just made more, I'd be content, and that's a lie. Um, I remember, I'll never forget. When I first started in the business, I went to California to see a client. Now remember, I was a school teacher, and so I made the mistake of telling Ron how much I made teaching, and he said, well, that's what I'll pay you. Okay, well, I, got, I painted houses in the summer, so I taught for nine months, painted houses. So I took a, what I was making in nine months, and I got paid over 12 months. Is that not a good deal? I, in essence, took a pay cut. You know, for, how do you do that? Take a pay cut from teaching to, get, to, to go into financial services. But I remember I was making $15,000 a year, had a client out in California making $600,000 a year. And I remember going out, meeting with this guy, and he was spending $700,000. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Russ, just let me try 600 for a while and I'll make sure I don't spend it. But, but, here, but here's the point, men and women. I learned a very important, I remember coming home, walked into the apartment, put my arm around Julie and said, honey, I learned a very important lesson on this trip. Financial contentment has nothing to do with how much you make. It has everything to do with spending less than you make. See that diagram at the top? See the financial diagram? You just need to make sure you have a positive margin. I'm getting ready to write another book and it's gonna be all about that diagram. Because the one key to financial success is having a positive margin. You can't make enough if you don't figure out how to make sure the other boxes don't exceed that. I'm glad I learned this in 1980-81. So even though I was spending, making 15, I was spending 14 $9.99, okay? <laughs> Wasn't a lot of extra back then. But the point is, Fast forward 40 years, you do that for a long time, it all works. I'm just telling you, it's not complicated. Financial planning is not complicated. That diagram at the top is all you need to know. Make sure you know what number's in each box and make sure the margin number, the number at the bottom is positive. Is it called margin on your sheet? Yeah, make sure margin is positive. That's it, that's all there is to it. But I've done this for a long time and I've, it's interesting that many people don't know what's in all the boxes. Some people think their income box is their take home and that's not, that's not what it should be. It's your gross income, but I see this all the time. So financial contentment has nothing to do with how much you make. It has to do with spending less than you make and do it for a long time. So when I think about contentment, I love this story here. There was a um, American businessman was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village with a, when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. And inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked him how long it took him to catch him. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, well, why didn't you stay out there longer and catch more fish? The Mexican said he had enough to support the needs of his family. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late, I play with my children, I take a siesta with my wife Maria, I stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full busy life, senor. American scoffed, said, I'm a Harvard MBA and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing with the proceeds buy a bigger boat and with the proceeds from the bigger boat you could buy several boats. Eventually you would have a fleet of fishing boats. 
An installing shear catch to the middleman, you would sell directly to the processor. Eventually opening your own cannery, you would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would need to leave the small coastal fishing village, move to Mexico City, and then LA, and eventually New York, where you could run your expanding enterprise. <laughs> Mexican fishermen asked, Senor, how long will all this take? American replied, 15 to 20 years. Then what, Senor? American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce the IPO, sell your company stock to the public, and become very rich. You would make millions. Millions, senor, then what? American said, then you could retire. You could move to a small coastal fishing village where you could sleep late, <laughs> fish a little. <laughs> you know, you know, we laugh at that, but there's one little part missing. It's that 15 or 20 years where potentially they were tremendously out of balance. And so they can't play with their kids and take a siesta with their wife, Maria, because they may not even still be married. So men and women, if I could just appeal to you, this is important perspective on how you earn your, uh, earn your money, how you invest it, and, and part of thinking right will help you not do crazy things with your money. You don't have to keep up. You don't have to get the bigger house. I went to Africa years ago, and in Africa, they don't have uh, starter huts. They have shelter, okay? And I learned a very important lesson by being over in Africa, you know, but here in this country, we have starter houses because we're going to get a bigger house. We're going to get out ahead of our skis. And guess what? We're going to have a really big house when there's nobody in it. Okay? Now, you can have as big a house as you want as long as you're spending less you make. Do whatever you want. But I'm just saying, be careful how you're thinking because usually the reason we get the big house is we're trying to impress a limited sphere of people. And guess what? Your kids don't care where you live. They really don't care where you live. So that's another, that's another thing. So money is not a guarantee of contentment. Wherever you are in your financial earning capability, and some of you will make less than others, and some of you will make more next year than this year, just spend less than you make. I just learned that if I just kept the margin in there, that it would work out. I didn't buy the lie. Well, just stretch. Your income will always go up. Don't buy that lie. You don't know that. Build a little cushion into your life. So money's not a measure of, not a guarantee of contentment. Thirdly, and I apologize for the, the way um, the, the printout came out. We took, took some stuff out and it kind of readjusted. So um, contentment comes from the process, not the product, for all you anal people that are still filling it out. Process, not the product. And then money is not a guarantee. The third thing about money, money is not a guarantee of success. It's interesting. I used to read the Bible verse in Joshua. It said, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. We should meditate on it day and night and be careful to according to all that is written in it. And then your way will be prosperous. And everything you do, you'll have success. Well, wait a minute. The, I just read that verse. The Bible says, If I do what's written in the Bible, I will have success. And I equated success to financial net worth. But if you look on the back of your sheet, you'll see the definition of success and prosperity. Success and prosperity have nothing to do with money. Wealth and riches are comparative in nature and have to do with money. Success and prosperity have to do with accomplishing a desired end or aim. Now you can be successful and have money, but you can be successful and not have money. Because if you go back and read that verse, what does it say? If you're careful to according to all that's written in it. So, men, when you love your wives as Christ loved the church, you're successful. When you train up your children the way they should go, you're successful. When you do your work heartily, when you work heartily for one life, you're successful. Because Colossians 3.23 says to do your work heartily is under the Lord. You see the difference? When you do what the Bible says, you're successful. Now, you may have money. I'm not saying you won't. But the world always equates success with money. When was the last time you thought the UPS guy coming to your house was successful? Or the butcher at the, at the grocery store behind the, the meat counter? Have you ever, I mean, we don't use success for some vocations, right? Because we, we don't stack them up. And we stack everybody up social economically and we equate the vocations that make the most money as successful and we don't know. You know, I'll never forget, Julie, my, my wife was a nurse in Estes before, you know, she retired and we started our family and she was in surgery one day with a plastic surgeon and, and she announces, they talk about you when they're doing surgery on I've learned this from talking to her. Her dad was an anesthesiologist and I'm like, oh man, all this stuff's going on when we're working on it. But she said, yeah, they were he was talking to the plastic surgeon and she said, I'm, I'm getting ready to quit. 
And you got to remember, I was making 15000 She was making about 8000 at the time. And um, this, this surgeon's probably making 600000 And um, he looks down over his mask at her and says, how can you afford to quit? You must be rich. And see, we just practiced the principle. We were spending less than we made. We were living in an apartment at the time. We didn't have any debt. But you know, he, he, was, he was so much in debt, he had no financial freedom. So here's the big idea. Don't get out of balance. Remember, this is all under the concept of being out of balance. We get out of balance because we think it's a measure of our self-worth. We think if I made more, I'd be content. And we think somehow I'm successful if I make more. No, you're successful when you work heartily, you do your best as under the Lord, you love your spouse, you raise up your children. This is why I appreciated what, what Scotty said, it's faith and family. This is how it all ties together. I've got to deal with my money, I've got to put food on the table, I've got to do all this, but I've got to somehow do it with balance so I don't get to the end of my life and have any regrets. So right thinking. Here's something else I'd have you write down. Measure wealth by the things you have that you would not take money for. Measure wealth by the things you have that you would not take money for. Like your health. We've heard health mentioned several times in here this morning. You know? So we have a lot of things to be thankful for that we take for granted. And so I love the idea that, that success and prosperity, they're not comparative. Somebody's richer than somebody else. Those are comparative words. Rich, poor, Wealth, not wealth, but success and prosperity aren't comparative words. Now, like I said, you can be successful and have money, but you can be successful and just barely be making it. You know, I'll say, I'll say one other thing, because I don't know y'all's income situations, but let me just say this when I speak to young couples. Everybody thinks that they make, and, and Scotty mentioned, I've had the privilege of working with the Kathy family for 20 years at Chick-fil-A. Everybody thinks that they just made more money, it'd get easier. I'm just here to tell you that's another lie. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. Because how, how do I leave it and what, what do I do with it and all these kind of things. And if you're just barely making it and you can just put food on the table and all that, then, then um, you may be better off than you think. And this kind of leads to the next th lie is don't try to get out of balance to give your kids all the stuff you didn't have. Your kids need to learn to be productive and content, not consumptive. Productive and content, not consumptive. If you teach your kids to be consumptive, then they're not free to do whatever God's called them to do. If you teach your daughters to be consumptive, then they may keep looking to your hand for provision rather than being able to live on what they marry into. When I asked my wife to marry me, she said no. You know why? Because she wanted to marry a doctor. She grew up in a doctor's family and she wasn't going to marry the school teacher. I was making seven fifty a month at the time when I started. I'm like, that ought to be good enough, nine grand a year. But her folks did a good job of telling her, this is our stuff, not your stuff. Don't get used to it. You know? And um, you, you may marry a guy that can't provide for you to the level you become accustomed. And so we do, we do our future marriages hang in the balance on this issue right here. And this is why if you don't have a lot, and guess what? Your kids have to work. And you don't leave them a big trust fund or whatever. That's why I'm saying it's really interesting. And it's why it goes all the way back to the top. Don't be out of balance trying to get all this stuff. When you know what, you're going to have what God wants you to have as you work heartily for Him. And then just do it with balance. Because you don't want to have any regrets. And see, you know, when you have money, you can, you can undermine your kid's work ethic, right? This will date me a little bit, but when I played basketball in high school, I had two choice of shoes. The Penny's Jeepers or the Canvas Converse. Now most of you are way younger than me in here, but does anybody remember those shoes? Canvas Converse. Penny's Jeepers. But then my, my junior year, they came out with these Adidas shoes. White with the three black stripes, remember? They still, yeah, now they're retro, right? And they're really the big thing. I was, it was like, man, I would have died. But you know, they were 30 bucks. $30 for those, and my folks couldn't afford those, so guess what? It was $8 canvas Converse. And here's the point, now, if I can buy my kids that stuff, I have to really wrestle with, should I? This is where it gets interesting. That's why if you don't have a lot, then you know, sometimes it makes it easier in this, in this parenting and how do I not undermine this work ethic? Because work ethic is what's gonna eventually help them have social capital. I told my three boys, guys, I want you to have it hard like I had it. 
And so I had to work real hard to, to, to help them understand some of these principles. So that's another thing to get your thinking on. Don't overwork and be out of balance trying to give your kids all the stuff you didn't have. And what they really need is more of you and less of your stuff. And the final thing that's messed us up on balance is wrong thinking about retirement. You know, that's a new phenomenon. Social Security Act of 1933, um, it came about because they wanted to get the older folks, there was, there was 13 million people unemployed after the Great Depression, so they wanted to get the older folks out. They set retirement age at 65 and life expectancy was 63, okay? And so Social Security Act came about and then what happened was the unions got a hold of it in the 40s, 50s, and 60s because there were more tax benefits to having pensions and retirements than, than some of the other compensation things. So pensions went mainstream in the 50s and 60s. And then guess what? The marketers got a hold of it. And they painted a picture of a retired couple on the beach, a retired couple in the mountains playing golf. And so all of a sudden, retirement in our generation has become mainstream, and now we're all in a hurry to quit. Where, where did that come from? The Bible only uses the word retire about retire from battle. It's not even a biblical concept. But you and I are growing up in a time where we're raising our family, we're working hard for one life, and by gosh, I gotta hurry up and quit. Then what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do then? Now I'm not saying if you have amassed financial wealth and wanna change what you're doing, I'm not saying don't do that. But it's a tremendous travesty to me to see people out of balance, back to the top of that diagram. I mean, my son called me from Auburn and said, hey dad, should I do a Roth IRA? I'm like, what? You're in college, why don't you like get out, buy a car, you know, make a house down payment. He's wanting to put money in retirement. And I understand compounding, I'm a financial guy, right? I understand compounding. But also understand living life and enjoying the trip. You know, I know if you start putting money away when you're 18 or you're 22 and it compounds, you'll be worth a gazillion dollars when you're 65. But I'm here to confess to you that every year is I did not fund my retirement plan. You know why? I was paying off my house. So I'd have time to coach my kids' football team or my kids' basketball team. See, this is how it all ties together. And I would just say we gotta be real careful about this retirement thing that what it's done is also exacerbated the stress in our lives. Because you're trying to feed the family, raise the kids, educate the kids, and then you've got to retire. Just push your time horizon out a little bit. Just push it out two or three years and see what that does for your enjoying the trip. Okay? So as I kind of wrap this up, I would just take you back. You know, and, and um, it's interesting. I spoke at a meeting over in Alabama last week, and one of the things that we did at that meeting was we wrote our eulogy. Yeah, you know, Billy talked about that, right? We need to live our lives backwards. So basically wrote out what I would hope they would say. So I wrote it as if I was 91. You know, I've been married for 67 years and taught for 67, you know, all these things. But I would just encourage each of you, as you're thinking, and it's all about thinking, as you try to figure out how do I balance money, work, family, faith, that it all comes back to the middle part of that diagram. I don't think there's any way that you get balance in life on the left and have no regrets on the right unless you deal with your money in a biblically sound way. Which simply put is spending less than you make and doing it for a long time. So my encouragement to you is if you don't have those boxes filled in, then make that an assignment. You know, somebody has said, don't leave here without going and doing something. Go draw that out on a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. I mean, this book I'm getting ready to write is gonna have a flip chart in it, because for 40 years, whenever Joe and I meet with a couple, we get a flip chart out and we draw the five uses of money. And we just start asking questions and fill in the boxes. So go home, fill in the boxes, and make sure you have a positive number. And when you have a positive number, then resist the urge to get out ahead of your skis and make it a positive number for a long time and live a balanced life to the best you can and then you will have no regrets. So I appreciate uh, Scotty and the team asking me to come share a little bit. I hope you've gotten something here that you can take with you. Um, the three books out there, Your Life Well Spent, is about this concept here. The Truth About Money Lies is a storybook where we take a lie we believe and, the, and un unpack the truth that counteracts the lie. And the leadership book is 
about how to be a great leader. So thank you very much. I mean, late morning. Um, hopefully you get back a little bit of your time. <laughs>